Thanks so much, MC. Um, well, thank you to uh, to all of you for attending, but uh, particular thanks to Pentax Medical for uh, their generous support, not only of this uh, series, but uh, all the other Insight series, and just for committing to, to educational uh, pursuits as they have. So tonight, uh, Maggie and I are gonna present uh, a talk that we like to call ERCP 101. So this is kind of geared towards um, trainees, uh, nurses, uh, early faculty, I mean, anybody really who's, you know, interested in, in setting up a, a unit uh, and, and, you know, training and performing ERCPs. So, you know, obviously this is, uh, this is a nursing insight series, so uh, the bulk of this is, is geared towards nurses, but I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of meat on the bone that we're going to try and unpack tonight in a fairly efficient way. So, for myself personally, I just want to take a, a second and say that it's a huge privilege for me to be presenting alongside Maggie, uh, who, along with other uh, nurses in our department, uh, you know, truly I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, so, you know, one thing that I want you to take away from this talk right off the hop is that uh, as nurses, if you're listening, um, you, you know, will have as much of an imprint, if not more, on, you know, the trainees and the physicians coming out and doing procedures um, than the actual doctors training them. So, uh, you know, do do listen to what Maggie has to say. And, and you know, by all means, uh, if there's one thing I want to convey, it's that ERCP is a team game and that, uh, you know, nurses are, are every bit as important as the physicians performing the procedure. So uh, let's get going. Um, so these are the objectives that Maggie and I wanted to cover tonight. So we wanted to basically go over what ERCP is, what some of the clinical indications are for the procedure, uh, and then importantly go over some relevant anatomical landmarks that will be um, of use to, to kind of have a good basis in. Uh, we're going to discuss some relevant uh, presentations and go through an ERCP case. Uh, from Maggie's perspective, uh, she's going to take you through the relevant pre, peri, and post procedural considerations from a nursing perspective uh, to manage your patient appropriately and safely. And then finally, we'll talk about setting up your room and talking about uh, the general sort of geographic, logistical, in-room considerations for ERCP procedures. So these are our disclosures. So let's start with the very basics. So what is ERCP? So I remember when I was in med school, this was a very intimidating acronym to memorize. And we'd always get asked what this is. And I probably remember like 50% of the time correctly. Uh, so if you actually break down the acronym into its individual parts, it's pretty easy to remember. So ERCP stands for endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, uh, which is a mouthful, but you know, each part again is kind of self-evident. So endoscopic means that it's performed, you know, through a natural orifice, through an endoscope. Retrograde uh, just means that we're going backwards into the bile, the bile ducts in the biliary tree. So rather than kind of burrowing a hole into the skin and then into the liver and finding small little intrahepatic bile ducts and going forwards, we're actually starting with the duodenum where the bile ducts drain out and going backwards. So retrograde just basically means backwards. Uh, so those two parts kind of explain the procedure. And then cholangio and pancreatography, all those mean is dealing with the bile ducts and the pancreas. So it's kind of a, a long name, but a necessary one that really kind of nicely describes the procedure. So ERCP is done for um, less and less diagnosis and more and more treatment of all sorts of pancreatic or biliary diseases. Uh, and the key with ERCP, as we'll kind of get into a little bit, is that um, unlike other endoscopic procedures such as EGD or colonoscopy, ERCP actually utilizes both simultaneous endoscopic and fluoroscopic imaging, which makes it kind of unique. So Again, the key to understanding ERCP starts with understanding your biliary and pancreatic anatomy. Um, so I thought we'd start just by kind of going through this. And I apologize if this is you know, um, common knowledge. I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page before we go any further. Um, so as we know, the liver synthesizes bile. Uh, and then you know, the, the hepatic cells kind of come together and form these ducts. Uh, and those drain the liver. So if you can see that there's the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct, those join together to form what's called the common hepatic duct, which is an unsurprising name. Uh, and then as you know, the gallbladder uh, kind of churns out the bile every time we eat. And it does so through a pipe called the cystic duct. So where the cystic duct connects to the common hepatic duct, those two join and then distal to that become the common bile duct. And the common bile duct drains out uh, sort of uh, in the second portion of the duodenum, the descending portion. Um, so the part where it comes out is actually called um, the, the major papilla. So here we've kind of zoomed in on the structures that we just talked about. So on the right there, you see all those structures 
that we just referred to. And if you kind of go to the bottom, uh, you'll see that the pancreatic duct, the blue one there, is actually in very, very close uh, spatial proximity to the common bile duct. Those two actually share a common channel, which is called the ampulla of batter. So then if you look at the diagram on the left, you'll see that that's, again, just a section of the small bowel, the duodenum, where everything kind of opens up. Uh, so there's a major duodenal papilla where all of that stuff drains out at the ampulla of Vader, which is connected uh, at the major duodenal papilla. So that was all kind of theoretical, and now this is what you know the actual things look like on the inside. So the left, uh, the left panel is from a study that we put out looking at uh, the different types of uh, papillas and what they mean for procedural success and complications. And as you can see, there's all sorts of different types. They're kind of like kind of like haircuts. You'll see all all kinds of different ones, everything from chrome dome to afro to uh, you know, shaggy sheepdog and all sorts of things in between. So uh, type ones are kind of the classic quintessential uh, major papilla uh, where, where we actually see, um, you know, those probably in, in excess of two thirds of the cases we do. Uh, type two, as you can see, you kind of have to squint a little bit harder and that's because that's the flat type of papilla. Uh, and then the type threes are kind of more protruding and or redundant. And there's type fours, which are ridged or creased. And then uh, we actually propose that there should be a new type called type D, where you see that they're kind of the papilla is associated with an intra duodenal um, diverticulum, which we do see from time to time as well. So then the panel on the right is actually the real time sort of fluoroscopic. This is a still image, of course, but in ERCP, you actually get real time fluoroscopic imaging, which is kind of just a moving X ray. Um, so uh, all of these different structures you're probably familiar with from you know, a slide ago when we looked at them. But just to go over them again, one is actually the, the ERCP scope. Uh, and then if you kind of look at, you know, two and five, those are the two different ducts, right? So two going off to the right is the pancreatic duct. Five is the common bile duct kind of going up and towards the left at 11 o'clock. Uh, you see the cystic duct with a gallbladder that's full of stones coming off at number four. And then number three, you remember above the cystic duct insertion, we refer to that as the common hepatic duct. And then there's the right and left above that and so forth. <laughs> So why do we do ERCP? Um, so again, from our data in Calgary, uh, we know that the most common indication by far, and this is you know not uh, not out of keeping with most most centers in the world, is for stone disease. So in this little diagram here, you can see you know, very easily if you've got a gallbladder full of stones, those stones can easily slip through the cystic duct and into the common hepatic duct and cause obstructions. Uh, so if those obstructions are significant enough, and then those patients will present with pain, uh, elevated liver enzymes, for instance, and often um, cholangitis, which is a, a life-threatening infection in the biliary tree. So luckily, we only see that um, you know less than four or five percent of the time. Um, the other uh, bulk of cases that we do are relating to strictures. Uh, so strictures are basically a fancy word for narrowing, and these can be in the biliary tree intrinsically, which means that the actual narrowing is within the bile duct, or they can be extrinsic. So it's just like a, uh, something pushing from the outside, like lymphoma, for example, or something else, uh, or, or more commonly an obstruction in the pancreas, in the head of the pancreas that's actually pushing the bile duct shut. Uh, and these can be benign um, narrowings or malignant narrowings. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other indications that we do probably less than one in 20 times, um, but uh, these are these are important as well. As I, as I mentioned, diagnostic ERCP is more or less a thing of the past. I, I can probably count on one hand the number of diagnostic ERCPs I've done since starting independent practice just about four years ago now. So that gives you an idea of, of how little we do of that. Um, so a quick overview of, you know, practice patterns and importance of ERCP. So this is a very, very commonly performed procedure. Uh, so about 400,000 of these are done a year uh, just in U.S. and Canada. Uh, and that's, you know, roughly for perspective equivalent to about the amount of outpatient or sorry, the, the amount of inpatient hip surgeries or appendectomies. They're kind of, uh, so I mean, those are all things that, uh, you know, we hear about more, but ERCPs are done, done just as often as those, those things. Um, and then, you know, as you guys know, uh, despite advances in EUS and other techniques, both you know, radiographic, surgical, and endoscopic techniques, the volumes of ERCP are actually pretty consistently high. So this is kind of you know, a snapshot of a decade, um, a little bit old now, I grant you, about seven or eight years ago. Uh, but in that decade, you can see that overall ERCP volume, you know, really stayed pat and if anything kind of rose toward the tail end of that of that curve. And you'll see that the blue curve is, again, diagnostic ERCP, which basically, um, you know, we don't do much of anymore. And that's certainly reflected in these nationwide data. 
Um, so, you know, the reason that you guys are all here is because ERCP is, you know, a little bit special. We like to think so anyway that do it. Uh, but, you know, the reality is, is that there's significant variations in ERCP practice uh, and there's quite a steep learning curve, both from a nursing and an MD perspective in order to be able to successfully and safely perform the procedure. So, you know, the main reason um, that, that we care about ERCP so much is that it's actually associated with the highest adverse event profile amongst all endoscopic procedures, really. Uh, and when I say that, I mean, you know, the commonly performed ones, especially with the volumes that, that they're performed at, like I just showed you. Uh, so post-ERCP pancreatitis, or PEP, uh, accounts for 5 to 10% of cases, which is pretty sobering and pretty humbling. That means if you have a busy call week of ERCP and you do 40 cases, you're talking about two or three, you know, two or three patients uh, that could potentially end up with pancreatitis as a result of your procedure, uh, which again is quite, you know, quite humbling. Uh, there are other things that can occur. So cholangitis, again, um, you know, ERCPs can cure cholangitis, but they can actually cause cholangitis in certain cases, especially if things are not left uh, drained properly. Uh, bleeding is always a potential outcome. Uh, perforation is another one. Uh, both those are uh, relatively uh, rarer. Uh, and then, you know, if you add them all together, again, a very sobering statistic. The overall sort of rate of unplanned healthcare encounters after ERCP is somewhere in one in five. So that means in every you know every five patients you do, there's a chance that one of them is going to seek care for something, uh, be it you know abdominal pain that's not going away, or an infection, or pancreatitis, or bleeding. So obviously we do more uh, more good than harm with ERCP, but these numbers are something to bear in mind. The flip side to that coin uh, is that the cost related to unplanned healthcare utilization and adverse events for ERCP is quite uh, burdensome. Uh, so per admission, the cost related for you know one patient to be admitted for post-ERCP pancreatitis can be up to ten thousand dollars in Canada. In the U.S., it can be like five or six fold times higher than that. Uh, and the cost for uh, for cholangitis again can can get get up there at fifty thousand or more dollars in Canada. So the reason that you're all here, the reason that I think that most of you are here is that you want to deliver high quality ERCP and you want to train and, and, and be able to provide the best care that we can give. Um, so from, from a science perspective, we define quality as an individual's performance compared to a, a benchmark that's been kind of validated and or agreed upon. So there are a ton of examples in this uh, for colonoscopy. So adenoma detection rates is one such quality metric. Sequel intubation rates is another. Complication rates, et cetera, et cetera. So in ERCP, the quality is actually highly variable. So the quality is actually highly variable on the provider level. And, and these are some good data looking at multiple different studies that show that high level providers, so when I say that I mean high volumes, people who do more procedures a year actually have higher success rates significantly and lower adverse event rates. So again, this is a procedure that you know you really shouldn't be biting off unless you have a, a pretty um, pretty pivotal you know key critical mass of volumes to sustain your practice as a provider. And this has actually been shown on a unit level as well. So these are facilities, uh, and you can actually see the trend here too. So as you go to the right on the x-axis and do more and more procedures as a facility or provide as a sort of health center, your uh, unplanned healthcare encounter rate for your patients that have ERCP done by you fall pretty dramatically. So you can see as you get past that kind of 180 to 200 um, you know, threshold or lower, uh, you can start to see a really sharp increase in the number of uh, unplanned healthcare events that your patients experience. Uh, so all of this is to say that ERCP is quite important and doing it the right way uh, is critical, uh, both from an MD perspective, but more relevantly to you from a nursing perspective. Um, so this is, this is kind of a uh, again, um, if you can, if, you know, take a couple of things away from this slide, that's that's key as well. So again, post-ERCP pancreatitis or PEP, uh, if you had to pick one thing, is kind of the driver of the, you know, the most kind of feared and common adverse event related to ERCP. So um, just remember that there are patient-related factors, procedure-related factors, and then operator-related factors. So there's not much you can do about the patient-related ones. Uh, you can't really change somebody's age or sex or whether they've uh, you know got chronic pancreatitis uh, but what we can modify is sort of the column in the middle and so that's that's kind of um, going to be the focus uh, not so much of this talk but of future ones um, and you know for now Maggie's going to take you through um, what we can do to optimize the procedure from a nursing perspective to try and keep everybody safe and try and minimize the risk of these complications.